All right, thank you to everyone who, um, who is tuned in tonight. My name's Liberty and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, we're so excited um, to be able to host uh, poet, essayist, and translator Lina Halak Dupaha tonight in conversation with author Susan Madi uh, Daraj. They'll be discussing Elena's uh, newest work, Something About Living, uh, which is a collection that explores love as a radical act in the context of diaspora, colonialism, and the long suffering of Palestine. Um, if you don't already know, Firestorm is an almost 16 year old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in uh, Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. We strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and um, the needs of marginalized communities in the South in particular. We also continue to book events like this one online because it's wonderful to be able to connect with authors across borders and time zones as we are tonight, um, as well as to be able to include community members for whom in-person events uh, still have significant uh, barriers to access. So um, if you're interested in keeping up with our future events, I would encourage you to take a look at our social media, um, sign up for our newsletter, um, or, or connect with us in some other way. I'll, I'll put a couple links in the chat. For tonight, we are using um, Zoom's Q&A tool. Uh, depending on whether you're on a phone or a computer, it'll be at the top or bottom of your screen. Uh, and you can use that tool to submit a question uh, for our authors. Uh, go ahead and do that whenever you have a chance or something passes uh, across your mind. Uh, we're happy to collect those and then we'll have a little bit of time kind of at the end of the conversation to circle back and uh, pick up as many of those as possible. Before we get started, I'd also like to thank Gayatri Sethi who connected us with Lena and Susan. We wouldn't be here without Gayatri and we deeply appreciate her support of both our co-op and these two writers. All right. I'm gonna introduce Susan and then she'll take it from here. Susan Madi Darash is an award-winning writer of books for adults and children. She won an American Book Award, two Arab American Book Awards and a Maryland State Arts Council Independent Artist Award. In 2018, she was named a USA Artist Ford Fellow. Her books include her linked short story collection, A Curious Land, as well as the Fada Rocks children's book series. She lives in Baltimore, where she teaches creative writing at Hartford Community College and the Johns Hopkins University. Her new novel, Behind You is the Sea, was published in January 2024 by Harper Via. It received praise from the New York Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, and Ms. Magazine, and was also named a best book of 2024 by The New Yorker and Apple Books. Susan, thanks so much. I'm gonna pass off to you. Thank you so much, Liberty. Thank you to Liberty and to the Firestorm Collective for hosting us tonight. It's a really, uh, it was a real honor for me to be invited to join Lena tonight. And a big heart to Gayatri, um, who is just a, just a marvel and a wonderful human being and a sister to all of us. Thank you, Gayatri, for helping us shape tonight's event. Um, it is my joy and honor to be with you tonight to talk to Lena Khalaf Dufaha about her new book. Lena is a poet, an essayist, and a translator. She is the author of three books of poetry, Water and Salt, which was published by Red Hen Press, um, and it won the 2018 Washington State Book Award for Poetry. Her second book was Gan and Her Sisters, which was published in 2023 by Trio House Press. And the latest book is Something About Living, which won the 2022 Akron Prize for Poetry from the University of Akron Press. Um, and it was just published um, this year. And I'm just so happy. And I'm going to do a bit of a lengthy bio on Lena besides the standard bio, because um, I just want to I want everyone to understand what a dynamic poet and human being we are we are speaking to tonight, Lena is a person that I met, I believe, online several years ago. And I only met her in person um, seven or eight months ago, but we met online several years ago. And we became quickly um, 
of a like mind. We understood that we were two Palestinian women of a like mind. And we actually began collaborating on a lot of different cultural projects. Um, there was a campaign that we started called Tweet Your Thobe to celebrate the inauguration of Rashida Tlaib to Congress. That was back in 2019, I believe. And I reached out to Lena to join me and help me with this project. And we did it together and it was just fantastic. Um, in 2020, we worked again together in the virtual, uh, the first ever Palestine Rights Festival, which was held virtually because of the pandemic. And Lena played a really big part in that festival, um, doing translation, moderating sessions, reading her poetry, interviewing. Um, I believe you interviewed Ibrahim Nasrallah and that's in that first festival. And again, Lena came back to work with us in the second Palestine Rights Festival, which was held in person in September of 2023. Again, moderating some sessions, reading her poetry, just being a dynamic presence. So I feel like I'm in the presence of, um, of a true sister tonight and a, wo a woman who's not just a poet, but also a poet activist. And um, I'm, I'm really excited, Lena, to talk to you about this latest book. Congratulations on your latest publication. Thank you so much, Susan. That's maybe like the loveliest introduction ever. <laughs> <clears throat> because it, um, I think you're able to really see me for who um, who I aspire to be and the work that I hope to do. And so I'm grateful to you for naming naming those intersections and, and the projects I've had the privilege of working on with you. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for your kind words. And congratulations to you on your novel, which also came out I think late last year, early this year. Yeah, in January. Yeah. In January. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so you, much. Which everyone should go get a copy of immediately if they haven't already. Um, <laughs> well, I'm gonna... a massive fan. So in addition to being, I hope, a friend, I'm also a massive fan of Susan's writing. Um, oh, thank you. So, you know, this is just going to be mutual admiration society tonight. <laughs> yes, it's just going to be compliments back and forth. The back whole, and forth. The whole hour. Yes. Um, we started even with complimenting Gayatri and loving Gayatri. So we're just going right. to make it up Gayatri. <laughs> all the way. Um, I want to also mention, um, since you brought up my novel, I want to mention that when I was looking for, you know, I, I was looking when I was writing the novel and sort of finalizing it, um, Harper Collins asked me like, you know, what do you want to say? And like, do you want an epigraph? And I was sort of looking around for, uh, a work of literature or a quotation that would kind of capture the theme of the work. And I actually uh, used an excerpt from your poem, Ruin, which was published in Water and Salt. I absolutely love that poem. Would you mind, can I, can you indulge me and read that poem for us to start off this evening? I would love to, actually, that sounds like a great place to start. Um, <clears throat> so like you mentioned, Ruin is from my first book, Water and Salt. Ruin. If monuments are all that survive us, if Palmyra, dead for centuries, is all that stands for beauty, if blind to the blackened skies and the savagery of an unmaking, the eyes of a statue call to us, if the Aramaic of ruins speaks to us like no mother tongue, nor parched throats of orphans have. If a hunger stirs in each of us for a temple empty of worship, if our pulse quickens for the ghost of Zenobia's gowns, her diaphanous gaze, while the living, knee deep into their deaths, in smoldering cities, in boats dissolving in the sea, in swollen bellies of refugee camps, if all that breaks our hearts is yesterday and the silent colonnade anticipating the dynamite, if all we love is a lost world, then let the dust swallow our names. Let the maps beneath our feet burn. If all we are is past, who are these millions now gasping for air? you know, so powerful. And, and um, to me, that poem, what I hear in that poem, what I heard when I, when I, when I um, 
reached out to you to ask if I could include it in the novel, in the beginning of the novel, I heard this like very clear call for people around the world to, to look at us as who we are now, as opposed to looking at us as like a us being Palestinians, being Arabs, being people who are constantly narrated and not allowed to narrate, um, you know, the, the, this this call to see us as we are now, as opposed to simply looking at us through the lens of history. Is that, can you talk a little bit about what you meant in that poem or what, what you were aiming for? Yeah, I think you captured the heart of it so well. I, um, at the time I was uh, beginning to write drafts of that poem uh, was during some of the worst, one of the worst periods um, in the, of the war in Syria. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was struck by, and, you know, we see there are uh, correspondences or similarities in the Palestinian experience mm -hmm. in the past and, and now certainly as we have this live stream genocide mm -hmm. unfolding um, on our screens. But um, I was really struck as someone who was experiencing this war from the distance of my American life, but as an Arab who could hear the Arabic of people on screen and their devastation and their pleas and could look at them and see myself and my own children and my own family members in their mm -hmm. faces and in their lives at how little um, was getting through to people around me who, who didn't maybe share that heritage that, you know, people could just sort of go about their lives and not be totally wrecked by it and not feel sort of called to do something or to act. But then when uh, the uh, temple at Palmyra, the ancient uh, world heritage site was destroyed, mm -hmm. um, everybody got very, very invested very fast. Everybody being uh, people in the West uh, mm -hmm. and quite frankly, largely white people in the West, mm -hmm. to be explicit. Uh, and, and the paeans that were written to, you know, the importance of history and the beauty of the site and what it means for human civilization. And, and of course, I agree with all of those things. And human beings were being butchered yeah. for years before that, during that time and after. And they just never, our brown bodies never seem to elicit the, the immediate and necessary combination of empathy and action. Mm. Uh, the way that those structures from the past do. And it really made me reflect on um, how we are, as you said, always narrated and the kind of way we're frozen in time and, and dehumanized maybe even, even when the monuments of our past are being praised. Right. And, and, and people want to look at, um, what we contributed to ancient civilizations and such, but not at what we are enduring right now. And they don't want to, you know, dig into the whys of what, what we're enduring right now. And, what needs to happen in order to to stop it, and what is the role of the West in all of those things? And um, yeah, I thought it was just a really, really fascinating uh, poem. How would you? Let me ask you this: as you were putting together this new collection, um, this new latest collection that you wrote, um, um, how would you would you say that there was a shift in your writing style? I mean, how long did it take you to put together this new collection of poems? Would you say, and as you were doing it, was there a shift in your themes? Um, what was the process of putting this book together? How was it different than putting together your previous two collections? So this book, um, it's it's very different from my second book. The second book is, has almost a little bit of a narrative arc and has some characters that you follow, even though it's poems that you sort of follow through um, through the experience of the book. This one is not like that. It is genuinely a collection of poems. There are some themes, but uh, but not a narrative arc necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, I think of this book as a COVID baby <laughs> in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Some of the poems were certainly written before uh, COVID era, before 2020, but it started to take shape a few years into the pandemic as a, as a cohesive whole. I started mm -hmm. to see oh, maybe these things fit together. And then I kept writing into them. Like there are some poems that are, that are uh, later. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, but that's when it, you know, moved from poems to like, okay, maybe we're in, in a conversation here. Uh, and I think for me, 
the unifying the unifying idea or maybe two ideas were um the the just the contrast between the way I and every Palestinian I know from my generation, my kids' generation and my parents' generation, all of us here living in the United States are absented and erased in ways big and small every day. Um, so, you know, they're the, like the big events, the big news events and the, the destructive language that's used to talk about us or at us. But there's also just a million small ways in which that project of erasure plays out. Mm -hmm. But then also alongside that is a community that is exuberant. It's mm -hmm. such a, a magnificent and strange contrast, a community that is exuberant and very loving and very passionate and very uh, committed to that love. And that, that has been my experience. Um, from, you know, the way we invest obsessively deeply in our children and their lives and their educations and their happiness and, you know, and that just the the intensity and the love we have for our history and the um, how seriously we take preserving it and passing it on and advocating for it. And the like the Palestinians talking about their favorite dish is, you know, intense and <laughs> moving. It is. It's just, yes. it's a really loving um, group of human beings who love their connection to each other as well and to their culture. Um, and and I just thought the contrast between those two things like was interesting. And I wanted to, I wanted to write into those kind of swings of like, there are these deep tragedies that keep unfolding, that keep repeating and you know, through the complicity of the United States and other Western governments. Yeah. And there's this incredible flame that just cannot be put out. And, and we're seeing it now in the most extreme ways, of course. Like this book happens to have come out at this moment, which is yeah. wild. And I couldn't have predicted that. But um, mm -hmm. but that, that uh, defiant love uh, maybe did change my writing a little bit. Like it gave me permission to lean deeply and unapologetically into grief because I know that that love is there to counterbalance it. and sure. sustain it. Yeah. And I like that description of defiant love. Um, I remember it was just a small aside when I was writing my children's book, um, Farah Rocks, you know, I, I called my character Farah because that means joy in Arabic. And I wanted her to be I wanted to write a book about the joy of growing up in a Palestinian family, like how how beautiful of an experience it is. Um, and what you said also reminded me of the fact that like today in our uh, this current situation that's happening right now, I'm 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 amazed by how much is being written about it in places like The New York Times, The Atlantic um, and other venues. And those articles and op-eds and opinion pieces are being written not by Palestinians at all. They're being written by people who are not connected to the situation whatsoever. And it really mm -hmm. shocked me how those voices are being not included in the discussion, even though this situation is clearly impacting our community so much. Um, would you mind reading of some of the poems from the new book? Sure, I'd, I'd love, love to hear them. Um, so since we kind of started with the New York Times, which I think of as the mouthpiece of empire, um, uh, maybe we'll start with a poem that uh, engages the concept of empire. You know, you hear that terminology used a little bit more online now, but um, this is my take on it. And this is a poem that uh, pays homage to Edward Said. It borrows a line of his uh, in which he says, every empire tells, tells its subjects a story, but then I... I do my own work with that opening. To be self-evident. Every empire tells its subjects a story of revelation. The trees let down their aging leaves, listless in late drought. The children thrive on filtration, their classroom air and their selfies sanitized. Every empire seems invincible as its borders submerge, its manicured hillsides incinerate between guaranteed next day deliveries. Every empire eulogizes its value system, splurges for pyrotechnics, 
decorates its mausoleums for the holidays. Every empire turns against its colonies, cradling the embassy's crystal and bubble wrap, packing extra treats for the dogs on the evacuation flight home. Every empire promises a revolution against itself. The children are tasked with designing the future, growing walls of hydroponic greens, rebranding old protest anthems. Every empire denies the iceberg it crashes into, hires a chorus, funds the arts. Every empire sings itself a lullaby. Magnificent. Thank you. And I think um, I'll follow that with, uh, one of the things that is a feature of Palestinian life is the number of anniversaries we unfortunately have to mark. Um, in my previous book, in the book, Ken and Her Sisters, there's a line in a poem uh, in which I say, repetition is a Nakba. And the Nakba is our kind of um, origin story of losing our homeland. But since the Nakba, there have been many, many, many massacres and uh, devastations because the Nakba is actually the beginning point of a genocide against Palestinians that sometimes is going at a very fast rate, a horrifically fast rate like we see now, and sometimes is on a slow burn and then, you know, will flare up. But the reality is that an ethno state can only exist if it eliminates the native people that it is there to replace. And so that has always been the project. Um, so these uh, anniversaries um, are a feature of our, of our lives, unfortunately. And one in particular that inspired this poem was the 2018 uh, March, the Great March for Return. Some viewers might know or might remember that there was a, an activist named Ahmed Abur Teme who organized these beautiful marches um, to the border in Gaza, to the border fence of refugees, because the overwhelming majority, of course, of people living in Gaza are refugees from other places in Palestine who were made refugees in 1948 and ended up in Gaza. And these uh, refugees began to march to the border fence and just demand the simplest and most basic human right, which is to go home. And they were met, of course, with horrific violence. So this is variations on a last chance. The fence does not hold. The wire sheds its barbs, softens to silk thread. The snipers run out of bullets. The desert, as it always has, of its own volition, blooms. The snipers are distracted sexting their girlfriends. The sniper's eyes are blinded by smoke from our burning tires. The snipers wonder if they will ever see the end of us. The fence does not hold. The snipers take a lunch break. The bullets melt in their chambers. The bullets disintegrate when they reach the word press on Yasser's vest. The news finally breaks the stillness around us. The bullets will themselves away from the boy's skull. The boy's sandals sprout wings and he hovers above the bullet's path. The snipers lose interest in shooting at medics evacuating the wounded. The snipers make eye contact with one of us and see. There are enough saline bags at the hospital. The snipers shoot and miss and miss and miss. We outrun the snipers. We bury the dead at the fence, let their roots reach the other side of home. That is just incredibly powerful. I, I'm so glad that you um, gave testimony to the Great March of Return. You know, in this current moment, I've heard a lot of people talking about, you know, who's to blame, so on and so forth. And it's such a frustrating 
conversation to have with people when when we know there have been so many important nonviolent actions and efforts and initiatives. And this was, of course, one of them. And we know how how it turned out as as your poem testifies. Would you like to read anything else from the from the new book? Sure. Um, I'll say that just as a follow up to your to your point that yes, there certainly have been so many initiatives, and I hope that we can hold the truth that simply existing under occupation on occupied land, um, where a extreme military campaign that points its guns and tanks against you every day and getting up and going to work and going to school is nonviolent resistance, like Palestinian existence by default. I always try to make sure to say this is nonviolent resistance. It's the norm. Mm -hmm. It's just that our occupier is so spoiled that whenever any part of Palestinian society shifts to a different mode than that constant nonviolent resistance, you know, uh, we start time from that moment and forget everything that happened before, but actually the entire Palestinian population mm -hmm. worldwide is existing in a state of nonviolent resistance all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think it's acknowledged enough. It's part of that erasure that you talked about earlier, that there are ways that we are narrated that are exactly. incomplete and unfair. Um, so, yeah. Um. So I think, you know, maybe it's time for us to uh, have some fun at a politician's expense. <laughs> oh, That's Lena, please. <laughs> <laughs> I won't name the person, but those who know, know. And maybe you in your life have met a politician like this one. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I'll just say that the title of this poem is uh, the name of one of, I, I'm no longer allowed to say it is the Palestinian national dish, because that's a claim that will be met with, you know, argument. So it is one of the most important Palestinian dishes we have. And it's ma'lube or makluba. Uh, and the Arabic word makluba translates to upside down. The congressman began his remarks to a room of refugees and their children who had invited him to share their national dish after the most recent massacre with ultimately then ran his tongue across his front teeth. There is a special relationship then a slight twitch as his left hand flew up like a shield and he jammed his pinky fingernail beneath his top lip and excavated the gum line. I get it from behind his hand. Several of the elders leaned forward in their chairs to decipher, decipher his muffled pronouncements. Here's what I will say, emphasis on will, so that the room was now focused on what he wouldn't say, then finally a moment of audible relief as the shard of almond was dislodged, restoring peace to canine and incisor. Gracious in victory, he placed it ever so gently in his palm. His words dropped off as he examined it, and for a moment it was just the congressman and the almond in the room. When an elder cleared his throat and snapped him out of his reverie, he looked up at his hosts seated around the table and at the collapsing dome of fragrant rice, eggplant, and chicken at its center, and he remembered to offer the traditional greeting, you and I can agree the best hope is a return to negotiations. Wow. I, I love that hyper focus on the almond uh, jammed in his teeth. Just it's it's so symbolic of the of so many things, right? But most of all, the the ridiculousness of his position and of his um, attempting to speak to people of, about what they have been living through in in such a trivializing way, right? Um, that's fantastic. An homage. An homage yeah. to so many. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. With whom we've had the misfortune of dining. <laughs> what yes, can you indeed. do? <laughs> um, what do you think? Should we do one more? Or... Sure, that would be fantastic. And then I would like to ask you about um, your process as well. So Okay, great. And may I actually uh, just uh, interject and just remind everyone who's with us tonight, um, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, please put it in the Q&A. Uh, click on the Q&A button. I'll be monitoring um, those questions and comments and we'll have time for them at the end. Thank you.
تفضلي Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm debating. So this uh, this poem is uh, this will call in another one of our beloved Palestinian sisters, uh, sister writers and poets. Um, this poem is called a golden shovel, and a golden shovel means that uh, the end word of each line, if you look at it kind of sort of vertically down the page, uh, is a line that is borrowed lovingly from another poet. So this is a golden shovel after uh, Suhair Hamad, who's one of my favorite Palestinian poets and to whom I think we all owe a huge debt of gratitude. Slip shape. A hummingbird lavishes the lilac on the first morning I am by myself and the open window ushers in decanted perfume, the sea, rain on the brink of falling. What slip shape prayers a woman must make of her body. To write my way out of the stories of war, I wrote the war again and again I wrote its wounds. May arrives frenzied with questions. Whose children will we lose at the border? What use is it to remember what has never ended? To wax elegiac for how ardently we believed. This is not who we are, becomes anthem and divine decree, armor against the living. Here we remain, human and failing in our florid excesses, our national torpor, beings so fragile we might break. Can we, finally, and can we imagine what our new shapes might be? That's lovely. You and I... For some reason today, I'm thinking of the magnificent young protesters um, who are breaking our old brittle shapes right in front of our eyes and at immense cost to their, you know, young lives. And I just want to send so much love and admiration and respect to them and the parents who raised them so well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't say enough about... Um, about how they are answering the call of Palestinians in Gaza who have been hoping the world will step up for months and they have just met that call with, with such an immensity of love. Uh, and so I'm thinking of them, especially today. Um, thank you for, for calling, for, for, for highlighting them. You know, I've been in academia for probably, this is 26 years now, and there's all this pedagogy that we, we talk about. The flipped classroom is one of the newer things that people talk mm -hmm. about, flipping the classroom and letting the students be more in charge of their learning and owning their learning. And have they ever flipped the classroom? And I feel like I'm the student now and I'm learning so much from them. And the beautiful inclusivity that they ha are, are modeling for all of us, it, it's incredible. And I'm so impressed with how they are very focused and keeping the focus on stopping the genocide. And they're not intimidated, even though they are being intimidated. They're not, they're not intimidated. And it's, it's amazing. I think we're living in an, in an incredible moment. We so, really are. And it's a moment of connection. Like there was a, you know, there are points in our history earlier when internationalism was more, um, what's the word? Like you're, you're able to discern it more readily in our uh in our work uh to build a better world and i feel like they are bringing that back because the correspondence between them and people in Gaza is so direct mm -hmm. they are so clear mm -hmm. they're so clear about you know this being as you said a movement against genocide and for freedom and how our freedoms are intertwined and inseparable and it's it's really just um their laser focus and clarity are miraculous miraculous is an excellent word I, I feel like um, it's the only thing that's given me hope in the last seven months um, is, is, is watching them take over their campuses and demand, uh, demand justice. It's, it's amazing. Um, can we talk a little bit about your process? Because as a Palestinian writer, I, I know that um, what's happening in Palestine, you know, what's happening in other parts of the region affect your work, but, uh, you know, reading other writers, of course, influences your work. But when you sit down to write, wh where does a poem come from? Like when you are in that process, where does it start? 
I know for me as a novelist, it starts with a character and the character kind of sits mm. in my head for a few days and I play around with them and their motivations. But where does a poem come from? I'm saying this as someone who's incredibly jealous because I cannot write poetry and I love poetry so much. But can you talk to us a little bit about how a poem emerges? Sure. I, I think, um, I don't know if this is like a little bit negative, but there's part of me because I, I gave myself permission to start writing poems relatively late. I have always in the back of my mind, this idea that like, nobody really needs your poem. Like there are a lot of poetry books out there that are great. There are a lot of great poets. So not every precious thought that comes into your head, like the world needs. And so the bar is kind of high. <laughs> um, but you know, if I'm going to sit down, if something is going to demand that it is written, it it really has to do a lot of work to get my attention, right? And, and as moms, we know also that like, there is a lot going on. So yeah, um, <laughs> usually the poems that arrive, like I don't, I'm not one of these poets who has a daily writing practice. I ha That hasn't been my rhythm. Um, I have periods of writing and, 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 you know, be feeling, um, I don't love the word productive, but like inspired and, and, you know, engaged in my writing and other periods where I'm just taking in mm -hmm. what's happening and, and doing a lot of reading. I think of reading as pre-writing. Oh, uh, I love that. And being in conversation with all of the other poets in the world um, and across time who have written and just, you know, trying to keep that humility. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but if something is, is so intense and demanding my attention, then it usually will will generate a poem and and um and it's often uh it's often language driven i find now that i've written a few books i notice in myself that i am very attuned to uh syntax and to word choice and um you know a lot of my poems are in conversation with a particular phrase that might have a lot of different valences or a way a word has um marbled over time and changed and uh, I'm very interested in how language as a kind of um uh an expression of our thinking and our culture uh how it works and what it reveals about us and so I think a lot of my work is is language driven mm -hmm. uh, so I'm often often thinking about that and then I people who have studied with poetry with me I've taught poetry classes here and there know about my word bowl um so there's a little bowl on my desk and um anytime I read or hear a word that I like because of how it feels in my mouth or I love the meaning or the etymology or whatever or it's just something that I think is hilarious that's sort of a trend that word goes in the word bowl and when I sit down to write I usually pull a handful of words and they go at the top of my page and maybe I use them maybe I don't maybe I look them up maybe just the music of them but the word bowl practice is one I've shared with all of the people I've taught. And um, it's uh, it grounds me. I absolutely love that. I, I that's a that's a wonderful um, ritual that you have. That's it is fantastic. a ritual. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not too uptight. Like I said, I don't have to use the words in a poem. I don't it's not too rigid, but they're, they're just there. And I'm in the company of whatever that magical combination is for the day. And, mm -hmm. um, you know. Fantastic. It's yielded some interesting results. Do you have any other, um, tell us about other, other things that you do. Like, so, so for example, you said you write it on top, on the top of your page. I assume you're writing by hand. Uh, do you write in specific notebooks? Do you write on scrap paper? Um, how, how, do, like, what does your desk look like in terms of. Oh, your... I refuse to show you my desk. No, I will. <laughs> It's so mine weird. has candy all on the right side of it. It's filled with candy. So well, <laughs> fuel. like you can't, can't run on empty. <laughs> no, you can't. Um, no, um, it's, it's, uh, the desk of someone whose mind is busy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are many piles of many, I, I, I have a hard time doing just one thing. Um, yeah. so I'm usually reading multiple books at the same time and have, mm -hmm. you know, notes and kind of one of the things I give credit to Suhair Hamad for was she, um, I, I met her a couple of times at readings, but then we happened to be just pure luck uh, at Hedgebrook at the same time. Oh, wonderful. So mm -hmm. We had a couple of magnificent conversations um, that have stayed with me. Um, and I noticed at the time that she used the word study about her work. 
I'm studying this, or this is, you know, a study. And, and she just, she approached her work like a student. And I, I love that. Um, mm-hmm. So I think I've developed, um, uh, you know, learning from her developed a practice of like, if I find that something is interesting to me, I research it. Mm-hmm. For whatever reason, like maybe nothing comes of it, but I, I dig deep. And so I have piles of notes about whatever theme or idea or story or news item that I'm interested in. I have a bunch of files of these things. And sometimes I never go back to them, but a lot of times I do. Um, and yeah, and so the desk is, is cluttered with many, many islands of things. <laughs> <laughs> I think Suhair's uh, book, Born Palestinian, Born Black, was the was the first um, book by a Palestinian I'd read after Naomi Shihab Nye's work. So oh, I, yeah. I, I, in the nineties, early nineties, I, I read Naomi's books and I, for the first time I ever read a Palestinian American author. Yes. And then I came across to Hare's first book, I believe born Palestinian born yes. Black was her first book. Mm-hmm. And it just, it blew my mind. It was incredible. Yeah. Right. And it, That's so true for those of us of that generation. Like those were the two Palestinian women writing in the United States. And, uh, and they had an amazing, a very heavy lift. Yes, they did. um, Mm -hmm. To kind of craft their own language and, and uh, claim their images. And, and uh, yeah, so I think, I think those two women um, are important to many of us. And, and, and it also like their work is so different, right. And it represented this like wide range of topics and themes and styles that, that our community was writing in, which was fantastic. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We actually have um, some questions that are coming in. So um, I'm going to read some of these out. So um, Glenda is asking, um, can you share some of your favorite contemporary Palestinian poets and artists or writers of uh, other writers? We've just there mentioned are so Naomi many. and Suhair. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are so many. And I always feel like pressure because I'm like, oh my God. And many of them are beloved friends. And so um, I don't want to leave anyone out. So this is not an exclusive list mm-hmm. by any stretch of the imagination. Mm-hmm. But um, I really um, I really love the work of Hal Alian. Mm. who is both a poet and a novelist. And I think that uh, writing in multiple genres, like the one enriches the other. I think she does really interesting work, very evocative work. Mm -hmm. Um, She has a unique voice. I admire her work. And the list is sort of generated right now by who recently has published, which is not necessarily the best way, but it's just kind of how I'm I'm able to call people up. Um, Fadi Judah has a magnificent new book of poems that Mm -hmm. um, I have been also kind of telling everyone about uh the title is just uh, like brackets with three dots so Mm -hmm. you could call it ellipses or uh, you know it's Mm -hmm. uh, in a way untitled but it's a book of poems that were written during this genocide so it has the um intensity and the uh sort of um conversation with the moment that is is really unique um Mm -hmm. and fadi's a thinker whose, whose work i also really admire so those are two off the top of my head. And Fadi uh, just won the, the Jackson Prize, right? That's right. He just won Fadi. the Jackson Fadi. Prize Fadi. from Poets right. and Writers, which is okay. incredible. Yeah. And then um, leaving poetry behind for a second, I really love the work of Isabella Hamad, yeah. um, who's a novelist. Um, and she just won an award as well. And I can't remember that Aspen something. I'm oh, not as okay. on my fiction awards. So I apologize <laughs> for that. But her novel, her both her novels are great, but her um, more recent novel, Enter Ghost, is the one I think she won for, and uh, both books are are striking and magnificent. Mm-hmm. Books. Um, and then there's this novelist Susan Madi Daraj, who I'm a huge fan of. And um, I mean, the new book is is great, and I think you're you know uh, reading from it now and and traveling with it. But I was introduced to your work through your short story collection, and I love short stories. Uh, okay. The Inheritance of Exile, right? That's the that title. Was the first one, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, and that book has a very special place in my heart, and so I highly recommend. You know, if you want the deep cuts, Susan Madi Dadra, <laughs> get you. that book. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I just want to throw out there. Um, because Glenda asked me as well to share. I just want to throw out, I was just in um, uh, George Abraham and Zaina Azam, both were in Baltimore last weekend. And I was on a panel with them as well as with Leila Haddad. Yes. Um, 
and uh, we, we did a panel here at the City Lit Festival in Baltimore. So I, I love George's poetry. I love Zaina's poetry. I love Layla's essays and writing. So I just wanted to mention the three of them. Absolutely. It's impossible to narrow it. Like it, it really is. We need to publish a list because it's a very uh, talented and creative community across, you know, different uh, genres and, and in different generations. And so there's no way to do all of that justice. And just a quick question. And we actually have one of our talented sisters with us, uh, Sahar, uh, Sahar Mustafa is with us. Oh, in the chat. Hi, <laughs> I love Sahar. And, um, she has a question. Um, uh, Sahar is the author of The Beauty of Your Face, which is a beautiful, Amazing. beautiful, gorgeous beautiful. novel. Um, she's asking, she's saying, is it permissible to ask, um, but what has been, what has it been like launching your book during mm -hmm. this time? Um, what has it made, uh, what has it made you consider or ponder about writing and creating away from Palestine in North America um, what does it make you think of in terms of our, our roles or contributions as writers? Any thoughts about that? Gosh, that's such a good question. So yeah. I've had all of the incisive, hard-hitting questions. She <laughs> does. It's a good question. It is. Um, you know, uh, it, it's honestly hard to feel like anything we do here is relevant at all um, at this moment because, again, this is not a normal time that the world is experiencing. We're not the only ones living it. The world is experiencing a genocide of Palestinians. And, mm -hmm. it, you know, there, I don't know what comes after that. Um, so it's, it, in some ways it feels very difficult to, um, to focus on anything. Um, I'm grateful that in my work, I have opportunities to, um, to highlight who we are as a people and and to critique the forces and systems that have led us to this moment. So when I'm doing that, when I'm talking about those themes, I feel some relief at least that the poetry is in service of um, expressing those ideas and hopefully contributing to making the those truths clear. Mm -hmm. um, and everything comes second to stopping this genocide. Like mm -hmm. there's just not anything right now that's more immediately important than that than ending mm -hmm. the genocide and saving what and who can be saved because, you know, there's already a lot of devastation that will never be undone. Right. Uh, both in loss of life and in destruction of mm -hmm. the earth. And mm -hmm. So it, it, I don't know, I'm not sure how to hold all of that, to be completely honest. Um, I am think I'm trying to figure that out as I go along. Um, and I think part of the responsibility we all have as, you know, people who care about freedom generally, and also specifically Palestinians in this moment, is to make sure that when we are... Um, when we have any kind of platform that we are putting the attention back on our people in Gaza and our people in all of Palestine, because while the most extreme uh, parts of the genocide certainly are taking place in Gaza, there, you know, there are uh, daily invasions of towns mm -hmm. and villages throughout the West Bank, yes. which is and has been under occupation that has never ended. Uh, propaganda notwithstanding, and um, people's property is being destroyed, people's homes are being burned, people's children are being killed, people's parents are being killed. All of this is being done by the Israeli military at the behest of the Israeli government and funded by the United States of America and Western allies. So any conversation that is public facing that is not in service of pushing those truths feels hard for me. Like I, I'm just not as interested. I, I agree. And I think for a long time in the community, not in our community, but in general, when people talked about Palestine, there was almost um, like a hyper focus on, I'll call it normalization, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, oh, how can we get along and this kind of thing. And I, I, I've never liked that approach. I, I think it's always important to do what, you, what you're saying is to always recenter the conversation on Here's the crime. And today is day 205, right, of this genocide, this current instance. But 
you know, always like recenter what is happening, who's doing it, how it needs to stop, who's funding it and how it needs to stop. Um, that's the most important thing we can do is just bring everyone's attention back to that because there's a lot of distractions um, in, in, in the discussions around this, this subject. Um, yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate that answer. I think that's wonderful. Um, do you have another poem you'd like to, to close out with? We are coming up to the end of the hour here. Sure. I cannot believe it. An hour has already gone by. <laughs> I knew that would happen. Good to be in conversation with you. So it didn't feel like an hour to me either. Um, I'm trying to decide which of these two. Um, see if I can do this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, this, um, I always kind of take a beat because sometimes it's hard to make it through this poem, but uh, it's mm -hmm. good to end on this note. So I'm going to try. <laughs> uh, the title of this poem is Du'a in my dialect, but tonight we will read it in the Gaza accent. So we'll say Dagga. At the restaurant, the loudest sound <clears throat> is the ocean a few blocks away. A meteor shower is forecast, a once in a lifetime event, but the freeway flush with headlights precludes us from viewing. The stars fall silently over us and the waves and the commuters. We review the menu. We help the waitress pronounce dagga. We talk about aging, and what is left to risk. Love is paying attention, I remark, and you repeat it to me. Love is also the father who plants an olive tree for every newborn, trusting they will grow up to harvest it. Love is the elderly woman who stood inside Damascus Gate, knowing the settlers were on a rampage, knowing what her body would have to endure. Love is a story we never tire of telling, just as Shireen told it with a microphone and a camera. Love lives in many rooms, in the kitchen where Nadia teaches using only the Arabic names of ingredients, and in the car where Lemma embroiders wine-colored roosters and cypresses on ancestral linen, waiting to pick up her children from school. Love is the children we carried at the protests leading their own marches in the rain. Let the stars fall. I have no idea what hope is, but our people have taught us, have taught me a million ways to love. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. I was, uh, I was thinking the other day about how despite everything that we're seeing on a daily basis, we are still seeing many, many examples of people loving each other. We're seeing adults sing songs for children and we're seeing people make swings out of cables so children can have a little fun. And, and we're seeing people hold each other and cry with each other. And we're just, we're just seeing the beauty and the love that lives in the community. Mm -hmm. And um, I think your poem is a perfect way to close the evening, giving testimony to that. Thank you. Thank you for that so much. Thank and thank you. you for this conversation. This was really lovely. Thank you. It was great to be in conversation with you. And thank you so much to Firestorm Books and to um, beloved Gayatri for making this, this first connection between us all and to everyone who joined us today. Thank you. Thank you, Elena and Susan. It was such a pleasure. Thank you. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. Take care. Take care. Bye bye.